Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another episode of In His Own Words. In this program, we look into the writings of Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, alayhi salatu wasalam, the promised Messiah, and that Messiah who is awaited by all religions, all the major religions throughout the world. Um, we have with us here in the studio Shahzad Ahmed Sahib and Usman Shahzad Bhatt Sahib. Inshallah, in today's program, we'll be carrying on with the book, How to Be Free from Sin. In the previous program, we spoke about the first part of it, uh, the first half. Uh, we couldn't cover all of it, so we're going to cover the rest of this book in this program and see in light of what Hazur has written himself, what, has, what um, um, this book is all about. Just as a reminder to our viewers, you can read these books at www.alislam.org. If you go into the library section under the English books, you will see all of these books that we're covering in our programs there. And we encourage our readers to go back <clears throat> and read these books for, them, for yourselves because what we're doing here is just giving a brief insight into the books. We're reading um, from different passages, the main passages which we feel may convey the deeper meaning of the book. But obviously in half an hour we can only do so much to convey the real meaning or the real essence of the book. And the only um, real justice can be done when you go back and read these books for yourself and that is the purpose of this program. Um, gentlemen, Jazakallah for being with us here today. Um, in the previous program, as I said in the first part of this book, um, we see that Hazrat Musim al in um, How to Be Free from Sin, he's talking about the spiritual and moral decline of mankind, of how people have come to such a low level in certain uh, you know, parts of the world, in most parts of the world. And then he talks about um, the final battle. This, is, this age or this era is the final battle of good and evil. And Hazrat Masim Wasallam, his appearance in this world is not um, you know, a mere coincidence. It's in, in line with that very fact that this is the final battle between good and evil. And then in that very part the, of the, the last program that we dis discussed, um, Hazur talks about how certain Muslims, um, they bring shame to the name of Islam and they bring shame to the name of Hazrat Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Carrying on from that, Shahzad Sahib, we can start with you. Um, I mean, obviously, like I said, you know, there is a, there, this is the context that we're, that we're, yes. that we're in. As you mentioned, as Masim of the Wasalam, the Promised Messiah Islam, speaks about the, the, the situation of the world and the circumstances of the world, but in particularly about the state of the Muslims. And Azul says that that in itself is a, a reason and a need for the Imam or for a reformer to appear in the world. And as the Masim of Wasalam states, the current decline of Islam de demands a reformer. Islam today is in a very precarious state and its light has been almost completely eclipsed. The Muslims have erred not only in their beliefs but also in their practices. They have fabricated some traditions which have not only adversely affected their character but are also contrary to the divine law of nature. For example, divine law has established three basic human rights. One must not kill an innocent person, one must not injure someone's honour, and one must not unjustly appropriate another person's property. And yet there are Muslims who break all three of these commandments. They murder innocent people and do not fear God. And they're foolish Mulwis who have even issued edicts declaring it lawful to lure away or capture women of other religions whom they consider infidels and to take them as wives. So here's Masim Wasallam very briefly just talks about the deplorable situation that Muslims are in. And this is the extreme <coughs> situation that they're in. Exactly. And that in itself is the, the need for a reformer. Just as you presented what Hazrat Masim Wasallam just mentioned, on the other hand, Hazul further on states that whilst these people have gone to one extreme, there are others who have gone to the other, crossing all the limits in their denial of spiritual blessings, let alone sainthood. They do not even have the slightest regard for prophethood. They reject miracles, deride them and mock at them, and consider revelation to be a product of recipient's own mind, resulting from an inherent genius. Hazul further then states how these very people, um, they don't believe in this concept of the soul and the day of resurrection, and they believe it's a myth. And Hazul says this is down to their ignorance. And then Hazul further states, they believe that all wisdom lies in the acquisition of material gains, and following and emulating those who are relentless in the pursuit of the world. These are the extreme positions which the Muslims hold vis-a-vis -vis prophethood and resurrection. Absolutely, I mean, 
this is very, you know, what Hazrat Muhammad Salam is explaining how what he's explaining is in fact very contemporary. You know, we see that although it happened 100 or so years ago, 120 or so years ago, the same condition you see it today as well, where you see Muslims on two extremes. You know, on the one hand, they're doing um, practicing Islam to the to you know to the fundamental smallest things, and they're making it. Um, a, more of a difficulty or a burden upon the people who are, you know, their subjects or their followers. And then you have others who are completely nullifying um, the, the essence of uh, belief in God or uh, the divinity of God and the, the status of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu and Islam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi in this very context, he says that even in their day-to-day -day conduct, we find the Muslims at one extreme of the spectrum or the other. They lack any sense of moderation in words, actions, morals, marriage, divorce, parsimony, wastefulness, anger, mercy, revenge, or forgiveness. So, you know, like I just said, they're completely um, disregarding the fundamental beliefs of Islam in both extremes. They're at both extremes, and I think it's what is needed is the path of moderation. And unfortunately, Muslims, at the time of the Promised Messiah, والسلام, and as you said, even now, we yeah. find that they're at both at the ends of the, uh, ends of the, the, the spectrum. Muhammad Masih Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam doesn't only just speak about the Muslims but he says that the Christians also fare no better and speaking about the Christians he says the Christians inhabit a part of the world that is known for its intellectual prowess this should have been a source of great hope but I regret to say that they have squandered the acquired knowledge of science and philosophy when it comes to matters of religion and the unity of God and as Masih Muhammad further states that we are at a loss to understand how their intellect can work so wonderfully in worldly matters but fails them completely when it comes to recognizing God. So also the Christians are also at, a, at an extreme end as well. Mm. If you see that in terms of their worldly affairs and their materialistic advancements, one wonders how amazingly they work and you know, as I was talking about the industries that come into existence in just in a matter of days and how they work and function so so uh, so their operation and processes work so beautifully and in such uniform processes but then on the other hand when they apply that same sort of uh, that practice is not then applied when it comes to religion when it comes to the concept of spirituality and exploring their spiritual faculties they have such irrational and absurd ideologies and concepts regarding the soul and the concept of God that they also fall in two extremes when it comes to the world they're, you know, in, it's extreme end in terms of their materialistic advancement. And when it comes to God, they're on the complete other extreme end of having a completely absurd view of religion. So it's also the Christians and Muslims both are in a deplorable situation. And it's the reason why reformer is needed for the whole world, for the whole of mankind, to bring them all under the banner of Islam. Azul then actually <coughs> presents the difference between the two and mentions how on one end there are those who are um, not observing the rights of mankind by their ill treatment towards them. And on the other hand, there are those who are not observing their rights to God Almighty with regards to worship. Hazul further states, Muslims no longer have love and compassion for their fellow beings because their misconceptions about jihad have made them hard-heartened. And then he further states about the Christians that as for the Christians, they have infringed upon the rights of the Almighty in every possible way. They have unreasonably taken a humble person to be their God but are no closer to achieving their purpose, which was to attain salvation. Absolutely. I mean, you know, this, this all reminds you of the, you know, the very basic hadith of the Holy Prophet ﷺ, which we as children and uh, the children of the MD Muslim Jamaat, they learn from a very young age, that the best of virtue is the, the, the path of moderation. The best path to take is that of moderation. And that is the basic tenet that these people um, seem to forget when they're propagating or teaching uh, Islam. Uh, carrying on from uh, that, um, now we come into the context of salvation and Hazrat Masih Islam, the Promised Messiah, talks about how salvation is another, like you said, you know, it's one of the, um, the rights that have been infringed upon by man and that is the right toward, own, uh, due towards God. The Promised Messiah states, if belief in the crucifixion of Christ was the only remedy for getting rid of sin, why has it failed in the case of the Europeans who indulge in such sinful acts that one is even ashamed to speak of them? They have advanced in sin and transgression to an extraordinary degree, and we cannot say that they are any less immoral than the Asians. 
and then the Promised Messiah والسلام, he goes on to say that after 1900 futile years is it still worth believing that faith in the crucifixion can bring about true salvation and now we're approaching you know 2016 years away from that this is you know 100 years ago the Promised Messiah والسلام, is raising the same issues which today many Christians themselves are questioning um, you know for, uh, regarding their own religion then uh, the Promised Messiah والسلام, he elaborates further on this and he says that the failure of this remedy to grant salvation from sin also falsifies the doctrine that the Son of God gave up his life for this purpose. We can never ascribe to God a death whereby he sacrifices his own life and yet fails to achieve his purpose. So this very, you know, this very concept completely contradicts the, the divinity of God Almighty and um, the, the status of this God Almighty. Christianity proposes as the as salvation, as to his, you know, the salvation of man's sin. That a, a humble man, they've put him up and said that his life has been sacrificed for their sins. And Hazrat Musaim of the Salatu is saying that despite believing in that concept, despite believing in the fact that Jesus, peace be upon him, died for their sins, yet their sins are still being committed. So, for as you mentioned as well, that for 1900 futile years, this remedy has not cured the the the, the, the ailment of sin. And so, as Musaim of the Salatu is further speaking about the sins that these people are committing and what is the root cause of these sins as well as Muslim Muslim presents something very interesting and I'll just share it with you. So he says, it is not true that the people of Europe, is it not true that the people of Europe excessively indulge in drinking and debauchery, the two major sins which satisfy the carnal pleasures? And is it not true that most men and women in Europe partake their full share of both of these sins? It would not be an exaggeration to say that Europe has surpassed the nations of Asia in the consumption of alcohol. In Europe, stores which sell wine are so common that their number exceeds the number of all the shops in our towns and villages. Experience shows that drinking is the root of all evil. Here's Masim Wasallam speaking about sin and evil says that experience shows that drinking is the root of all evil. For in a matter of minutes, it excites a person to a state where he is even ready to commit murder not to mention the other th sins that go with it. I emphatically declare that drinking and fear of God can never go together, and he cannot be called wise who does not understand the evil consequences of consuming alcohol. Another dangerous thing about alcoholism is that not everyone can give it up after it has become a habit. So <coughs> as Muslim Muslim, again, as you mentioned, the issues that he's addressing were not just something that were limited to a particular geographical landscape or a particular time, but the Azmasim of the Salaam is touching issues that were for all time to come. And the message is universal in its nature. Even today we are finding so many studies we find and the amount of strain that it has on the governments and health services through the consumption of alcohol and the amount of vice and immoral acts that are born out of the consumption of alcohol. And here as a Muslim of the Salatu Wasallam saying is that is the root of all evil. And 1400 years ago, Islam had completely forbidden this and prohibited uh, alcohol. And as a Muslim of the Salatu once again mentions this here in this book in connection with sin. And again, coming back to the title of the book, that how to be free from sin. Yeah. As a Muslim of the Salatu Wasallam mentions alcohol here and says that that is the root cause of all uh, evil and all sins emanate from that. It's interesting how Hazrat Muslim has put everything into perspective. You'd think that a uh, prophet who's appeared in India in the Punjab, he would address you know, the issues of the, the local surroundings, but he's addressing issues which were in Europe at that time. Absolutely. And not many people from the Punjab at that time had set foot in Europe. And the yeah, Prophet right. Islam is touching issues and you know, how to be free from sin, like you just said. And he's explaining to the Europeans how they can be free from sin. And that really just puts it into perspective. It really tells us how big this cause was and how Hazrat Muslim al-Islam, he saw his cause, the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat, that it was to grow. And, you know, we're sitting here in Europe and we're touching these issues. But at that time, it's even more extraordinary to know that Hazrat Muslim al-Islam knew, knew, knew everything about these You're issues. absolutely right. And in the same way, as we've just mentioned, Hazrat Muslim al-Islam presented Christianity's concept of salvation and also explained how it's failed miserably and also explained to us that true salvation is building a relationship with God Almighty, having a communion with Him, uh, being 
at true one. to him, at, at one with him, or being tr knowing the true awareness of God Almighty. And he states this and he says that it may also be asked, rather because the question, before I read this out, is the mm. question could be asked, then how comes Satan is not aware of God Almighty? Yeah. And Hazur addresses this question and he states that it may also be asked, why does Satan disobey God while he possesses true awareness? The answer is that Satan does not possess the kind of awareness that is bestowed upon those who truly deserve it. Man, by his very nature, is affected by knowledge and keeps away from the path of destruction when it, reve when it reveals its hideous countenance. Belief only means accepting something in good faith, but true awareness means to actually experience that belief. It is impossible for true awareness yani marifat, and sin to dwell in one heart, just as it is impossible for it to be day and night at the same time. Absolutely, and, and following on from you know that very question, where the Muslim is addressing how you know God Almighty gives that understanding of right and wrong and the true awareness to His chosen people and elect, um, Hazrat Muslim then goes on to talk about various sins and various risks, you know, day-to-day -day risks. For instance, you 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 know, if, if there's a fire in a building, you would jump out the window. If there is a snake in yeah. front of you, you'd run away. And talking about these issues, Hazrat Muslim Islam then addresses a question which is very pertinent, that if we are so careful about risks such as, you know, these very risks, then why do we not fear God's chastisement? That is the, you know, the main issue and the main question which everyone should ask themselves and everyone does. The, the, the Promised Messiah Islam, he says, the answer which a wise person will give after proper deliberation will be that this contradiction is due to the difference in the way we perceive the two things. Most people do not have sufficient awareness about sin, and even though they consider them to be harmful, do not avoid them as they would avoid a lion or a snake. Deep in their hearts, they do not really believe that they will be punished for their sins. They even doubt whether God really exists, and if he does, whether their souls will survive after death, and if they do, whether or not they will actually be punished for their sins. Then the Prophet Muhammad he goes on to say, the fact is that man is certain about the harmful effects of these things, but in the case of religious injunctions, he is not so sure, and his knowledge is based only on conjecture and myth, instead of personal experience. <clears throat> And myths cannot help a man to free himself from sin. Hence, even if a thousand messiahs were to be crucified, they would never bring about true salvation, for sin can only be got rid of through perfect fear or perfect love. What's interesting here is, as Muslim and I'm talking about how man today expects other people to be a source of, you know, a sort of path to leading him towards God Almighty. Where in fact the promised messiah says, no, you should, in, in other words, he's saying that you should try to look for God yourself. Yeah. You should not depend on any concept, any belief, salvation, any person to take you towards God. That path towards God is, ha is going to have to be It's a personal sought. journey that you have to make. And I think it's that, and it's that personal experience that you then have. That was a Muslim Adelai Salatu Salam has mentioned, which you've just quoted, which is that perfect fear or perfect love, yeah. which is born out of perfect certainty. Until you are not certain, as you've quoted in the examples as a Muslim Muhammad gave, that we see of the fear that we have in the world. If you have poison in your hand, you will not, you will not eat that poison. If you see a, a, a <coughs> fire, you will move away from it. If you see a harmful animal, you will move, move yeah. away from it. Because you have complete certainty that that thing will cause harm. Mm. Similarly, when you go on that personal journey and you come and you have a communion with Allah the Almighty, you have a very strong and pure relationship with Allah the Almighty, and then you become certain of His existence. And that's where this concept comes of perfect fear and perfect love. Mm. And once you have that perfection, that is true salvation, because then you will completely shun all vice and all harmful and evil things. Because you have certainty in God, you have certainty in the hereafter, and you have complete certainty in His rewards and also in His, uh, the punishment that He will deliver upon your uh, transgression. And so just elaborating on the concept of salvation, as Muslim Muhammad then says that salvation is not something specific to the hereafter. That is not just something that we want to be free from sins because so that our hereafter can be good. As Muslim Muhammad says that true salvation begins in this very life. It is a light that descends upon the soul and reveals the path that leads to destruction. Tread the path of truth and wisdom so that you may be led to God. 
and strengthen your hearts so that you may move towards the truth. Unfortunate is the heart that is cold and the spirit that is dead and the conscience that possesses no insight. Become like a pail that is lowered down a well empty and comes out full and not like a sieve that cannot hold any water. So again, it comes onto that concept of, <coughs> as you mentioned as well, it's that personal journey that you have to make. And it's whilst going on that journey that Allah the Almighty enlightens one's soul and you start developing that certainty. You start seeing the signs of Allah's existence and that certainty comes and it's because of that certainty, because if you have communion with Allah the Almighty, there's a two-way relationship and then you shun everything for the love of God, for the sake of Allah the Almighty and that leads to true salvation. Not believing in these erroneous concepts that we will believe in this humble man, he's passed away for our sins. Because as Muslim Muslim says that all those cures that other religions have presented have failed. They have failed for so many years. But the one cure that is everlasting and is perfect, as we mentioned, is that developing that perfect relationship with Allah Almighty, which will give you complete certainty about his existence. And then you will move away from all <coughs> evil and shun all that is bad. And elaborating on uh, true salvation, as a Muslim Muslim very beautifully further on states, true salvation cannot be found in filthy water. The water that cleanses the heart comes from heaven at its appointed time, and the river that carries it is free from dirt and filth, and its clean and pure water is eagerly used by people. The river that has stopped flowing and consists of stagnating water cannot enjoy such purity, for it gets mixed with mud and the excre excretion of animals. The heart which has been blessed with the knowledge of God and with conviction is like a full flowing river that irrigates all the fields in its way, and whose cool and clear water brings peace and solace to their burning hearts. Such water is not only pure, but, is, but it also purifies others by granting them wisdom that cleanses the rust off their hearts and makes them averse to sin. But the one who is like a little pool of water that is mixed with mud cannot do mankind any good, for he cannot even purify his own soul. And then further towards the end, Hazul states that do you imagine that you can truly hate sin unless your hearts have been filled with the majesty of God and you have been made cognizant of the glory and power of the living one and your hearts have been filled with the light of the certainty. No, there is only one way, just as there is only one God and one law. Absolutely. I mean, you know, this, and that, that completes the book. But you know, it's interesting how this whole book how to be free from sin. I mean, in the first program that we did and this program, all the issues that Hazrat Muslim Islam is touching, they're all contemporary. You know, from the fact that um, mankind is falling into a spiritual decline, moral decline, 100 or so years ago when the Industrial Revolution kicked in, technological advancement has, you know, sort of acted as the catalyst to man's, um, I would, uh, yeah, I mean, material progress, yeah. but the fact that he's degenerated spiritually and somewhat morally as well. I mean, these things, they have led us to understand that Hazrat Masih Madhul the Promised Messiah Islam's advent, it wasn't just, you know, by mere coincidence that he came at that time. That was the most perfect time for him to it appear. It was the need of the hour. And his Khilafat that has carried on, you know, the, the, the five Khulafa up until today, that by the sheer grace and blessings of Allah that have carried on this mission, they've all been doing it in sync with the modern advancement of man and uh, leading you know, man towards the truth, the, the, the true religion in the time or in a time when man has thought maybe that he's completely uh, surpassed all needs of, um, of a religion or of a divine being or of a, of a, of a, of a God. The Prophet encapsulates the whole, the whole, um, such a, uh, a deep subject in such few words, if you think about it, such a small booklet. How is Muslim of the has captured the whole essence of how to be free from sin. And as Masimah, what's really interesting for me about this book is how Masimah explains that this is the age of the battle and the final battle between good and evil. And how Masimah is saying over a hundred years ago that the Muslims have completely taken the wrong track in terms of thinking that this battle is going to be won by swords and winning territories. Absolutely. And we are seeing that this erroneous concept of jihad that they are presenting is doing no favor to Islam whatsoever, but is actually further uh, projecting Islam in a very 
uh, is dishonoring Islam uh, and, the te and completely uh, manipulating the teachings of the Holy Prophet ﷺ. They've completely moved away from the true teachings of Islam. But that true the battle and the true victory is actually going to come from Allah the Almighty through His spiritual light and the water that He is, the heavenly water that's going to descend from the, the skies. And that actually comes in the form of prophets and messengers and reformers. Yeah. And that's why we see that even the Quran likens you know, the, uh, the situation of the world when it's in complete corruption to a land that's barren. Yeah. And then water descends upon it. And that water in the essentially is revelation. And it's the advent of prophets and messengers. And we see that water has fallen so timely in this day and age. Right as you said, it's not just no coincidence. Mm. It's, this is the age of the final battle. And as a Muslim of the advent has taken place. And through clear signs and miracles and through the help of Allah the Almighty, that battle has commenced. And as a Muslim of the you know, all the, the books that he's written, these heavenly treasures, these are the, the tools of the victory. And the spiritual betterment that we will undergo ourselves, the battle that we fight within ourselves as a Muslim of the Islam saying, and that journey, that personal journey that we have to make individually, that's the battle. And through that battle, we overcome the Satan that is within us, as the Holy Prophet said, course. that it, through everyone's veins and blood vessels runs a Satan. When we overcome that Satan and form a communion with Allah the Almighty, we become at one with Allah the Almighty, that's when we develop certainty. Yeah. And once that certainty is there, we move away from sin. And when you move away from sin, that in fact is the ultimate victory when you have overcome your Satan and become a true Muslim Absolutely. It's and just are submitting like, to the will of Allah. It's just like when you, know, when you say that you are your own enemy. You are the first. And, and that's what Hazrat Muslim Allah Islam has said mm. in one, one of his um, uh, couplets. I don't know if I've Absolutely. worded it correctly, but that is the, the context mm. of what he said, that your own nafs, your own self, Do that is know. the worst enemy, that is your worst enemy. And usko maro, you should and completely... And once you overcome that, that is the ultimate battle. And that's yeah. how Muslim has mm. so wonderfully explained in such a short book like her, mm. um, of how to be free from sin. Absolutely. You know, Jazakallah Shazad Sab and Usman Shazad Bhakt Sahib. Um, as Shazad Sab quite rightly said, that these books are the, um, if you like, the artillery that we have to equip ourselves with in this day and age. This is the knowledge that we need to equip ourselves with. We as Ahmadi Muslims, we refer to these books of the Promised Messiah, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Sahib al -Islam, as the spiritual treasures, the Ruhani Khazain. But we cannot do justice to them as being treasures until and unless we pick up these books or search for them online. I mean, now they're at the click of a button on the internet. You literally just have to click a few buttons and it's there before you. You just have to take the time out, maybe an hour, half an hour, just read through them. Read through one book. Read through one book and you will understand that Hazrat Masih Maudalai's words were no ordinary words. They were in sync with what is happening in the modern day and they were in sync with what we need to do to become better human beings. Um, like we've said before, we'll continue saying it, that you can read these books on www.alislam.org in the library section under the Eng English books. You can find these books there. Um, or uh, you can purchase them in your local jamaats. We have bookshops, uh, bookstalls set up in various places throughout the world where our jamaat, where the Ahmadiyya Muslim community has been established. You can purchase them there. Until next time, from all of us here, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.